Amen. Now, the part of the chapter that I'd like to focus on is beginning in verse 15, where the Bible reads, So as much as in me is, I am ready to preach the gospel to you that are at Rome also. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. And that's what I want to preach about this morning, being ready to preach the gospel. Are you ready to preach the gospel? Meaning that if given the opportunity, would you be ready and capable of giving someone the gospel, of winning someone to Christ? If you were confronted with an unsaved person and the opportunity to get them saved, would you know what to do? Uh, do you know how to go out and knock doors and, and give the gospel to people and, and to do a thorough job and to be effective? Paul said, I'm ready. I, as much as in me is, he's saying, you know, I, I've got the word of God in me. I've got the teaching. I am ready to preach the gospel, and we need to be ready also. Go, if you would, to Acts chapter 2. You say, why would you uh, teach this on a Sunday morning? A lot of churches, they'll have maybe a separate soul winning class, or, you know, maybe you show up at one of the soul winning times, and they'll have some training for you. The reason that I'm going to teach this on a Sunday morning is because I strongly believe that everybody needs to be a soul winner. Soul winning is for everybody. Preaching the gospel is for every single person. I'm going to show you that in the Bible. It's not just for a pastor. It's not just for a select few or the young people. It's something that all of us as God's people should take part in. The Bible says that Jesus said in Matthew 4, you're in Acts 2, but it says, He saith unto them, Follow me and I will make you fishers of men. That's what being a follower of Christ is about. It's about reaching people with the gospel. Otherwise, when we got saved, we might as well have just gone straight to heaven. The reason that we're left on this earth is that we might reach the lost with the gospel. That's why we don't move our church out to some commune somewhere or go live out in isolation somewhere and do our own thing. No, we live in the city of Phoenix. We live in the city of Tempe so that we can be where the lost are and reach them with the gospel. That's why we're here. Now, the Bible says in Acts chapter 2, verse 16, but this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. Now, what's the this that he's referring to? In this passage, there were 120 believers in that early church, about the same number of people as are here this morning. But there were about 120 people in the church, and the Bible makes it clear that included the women also, as men and women. And the Bible talks about the fact that there were all these devout men from all over the world, from all different parts of the world, that were gathered at Jerusalem for the Feast of Pentecost. And while they were there, that early church is actually giving them the gospel or preaching them the gospel. They're actually doing soul winning amongst this crowd of people that have assembled. And God performed a miracle in this chapter where they actually are able to speak foreign languages that they'd never learned. So it was a miracle because people are from all over the world and yet they were able to give people the gospel in their own language, even though they were all Galileans. So it's a, it was an amazing miracle that took place. But look what it says in verse 17. This is what is said in reference to this event. And it shall come to pass in the last days, saith God, I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh, watch this, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams, and on my servants and on my handmaidens I will pour out in those days of my spirit, and they shall prophesy. What's the context of this scripture? An event where God's people, men and women, young and old, were giving the gospel unto people who were visiting Jerusalem from all parts of the world, and they are preaching the gospel unto these people. And God says, hey, this is the fulfillment of a, of a prophecy that God would pour out his spirit upon both male and female, and they would prophesy. That the young and the old would prophesy. Look, this passage proves, and I could, I could turn to a whole bunch of other passages, but that's not what the sermon's about. Just to prove to you that soul winning's for everybody. It's not just a man thing. It's a man and woman thing. It's not just for the young. It's for young and old. All of God's people can be used differently to reach souls for Christ. In fact, this is an extreme example, but my grandfather got saved as a result of a five-year-old boy who gave him the gospel. Now, that's an extreme situation, but a five-year-old boy walked up to my grandpa and preached him the gospel and quoted the salvation verses to him from the Romans Road. He didn't get saved right then and there, but he was so impressed by that, he said, I'm going to this kid's church on Sunday. He went to that church, and then a few days later, the pastor came and visited him in the home and won him to Christ. 
So he got saved as a result of that seed that was planted by that five-year-old boy. God wants to use everybody to get people saved and to win souls. And he can use us all in different ways. Now, first of all, let me say this. The best way to learn how to give the gospel or how to go soul winning is to go soul winning and to be a silent partner. Now, you don't have to turn there, but in Luke 10, chapter 1, it says, After these things the Lord appointed other seventy also, and sent them two and two before his face into every city and place whither he himself would come. So Jesus Christ at one point ordained 12 apostles, but then later he appointed 70 apostles. And these 70 apostles, he sent them out two by two, so basically 35 groups of two. He sent them out into all these cities and told them to preach. And they went out soul winning. So there is a biblical precedent or a biblical example for going out and knocking doors two by two. And so the best way to learn is just to get out there as a silent partner and just listen and just follow somebody around and just, that's how I learned. I mean, that's how I learned soul winning. But I still want to teach you this morning and I want to make sure that our church is on the same page with soul winning also. And I, I'm probably not going to get through all the material this morning. It's probably going to spill over into tonight, but I'm going to get as far in this as I can this morning. And you say, well, I'm just going to tune out because I'm not interested in soul winning. Shame on you because heaven and hell are real. And if heaven and hell are real, then we ought to be ready to preach the gospel. And you say, well, I'm not going to knock doors. Oh, well, what about your mom? What about your dad? What about your brother and sister and your co-workers and your friends and your family and your neighbors? Are you ready to preach the gospel? Or are you going to get an opportunity and fail to take that opportunity because you don't, you're not ready? Oh, 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 oh. What do you say? And I can tell you something. There were many times when I wanted to win people to Christ growing up. And I just didn't really know what I was doing, and so I failed. And I'd never won anybody to Christ until I was 17 years old when I went out and knocked doors and followed somebody around and learned from them. Then I started being effective at my job and, and, and with family and friends, giving them the gospel. Because I'd gotten the experience because I was ready to preach the gospel. But first of all, let's start out. I, I, this sermon is in three phases. And again, I might not get through all of it this morning. The three phases of, of, of giving the gospel is the beginning, the middle, and the end. Okay, And the reason I say that is because the hardest part of giving the gospel to somebody is the beginning and the end. The middle's not that hard. And so I see people struggle the most with kind of just getting started, you know, starting the conversation, getting into the gospel. That's, that's a tough part. And then another tough part is sometimes people get toward the end and they don't know how to land the plane. Okay, and, and they, they, they get through the material, but then they don't really know where to go next. And so I'm going to spend extra time on the beginning and the end. So first of all, let's start about the beginning. And, and this is going to apply to door knocking, but a lot of it is going to have carryover value just into your personal life. And I'm going to explain how that works. But first of all, let me say, and turn to Ephesians chapter 6, because that's the next scripture that we're going to look at is in Ephesians chapter 6. But number one, here's my, my tip for uh, uh, soul winning. Don't knock like the police. Now, I've noticed, I've noticed a trend in our church of people knocking doors like they're the police. And it's a bad idea because you know what you're doing is you're just you're making people on edge and agitated and up before they even get to the door. They're already like, what in the world? You know, who's banging on my door? So, you know, point one, don't knock like the police. This isn't a search warrant that you're executing, okay? And don't, if, and, and here's what I always tell people. If you're going to knock like the police, then knock the door and just get out of the way. You know, because a shotgun blast might come through the front door. That's what the police do when they beat on the door like that. They beat on it and then they get out of the way. But anyway, don't knock like the police. Have a friendly knock. And by the way, knock on the hinge. I always do this. I always knock on the hinge side of the door. And you say, well, why not? You know, why not honk, knock on this side? Because every once in a while, a door will be kind of ajar, and you walk up and go, and it's real awkward, you know, when the door just, when the door just swings open, and people are like, why did you just bust into my living room? So if it's a little bit ajar, and you knock on the hinge side, you know, it doesn't do that, okay? So the, yeah, some of this is just real practical, all right? And some of it's going to be biblical. So number one, don't knock like the police. Have a friendly knock, something like this. 
Just a nice, friendly, you know, get your, you can have your own style, but have a nice, friendly knock. Knock loud enough to be heard, but in a friendly way, okay? And, you know, you might knock a couple times to make sure, but just don't just. But I've been soul winning with people in our church that will like. It's like, what in the world? It's a bad idea, all right? So that's number one. Number two, smile and be friendly Amen. when you greet them. You need to be nice. The Bible says, let your speech be always with grace, seasoned with salt. You know, there's no reason to go in there just frowning and angry. You know, you need to be smiling, friendly, look people in the eye, shake the hand. You know, that's just basic common courtesy and kindness that the Bible teaches anyway. Number three, you need to pray for boldness. Okay, and, and look down at your, at your scripture there in Ephesians 6, verse 18. It says, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. So he's saying, you know, pray for, the, for your brothers and sisters in Christ. Pray for the saints. But then he says this, and for me. He's saying, pray for me. Look at Paul's prayer request. Pray for me that utterance may be given unto me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in bonds, that therein I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. What does boldness mean? What's a synonym for boldness? Courage, right? What's the opposite of boldness? Fear, being timid, cowardly. Do not be timid and cowardly and fearful when you go so Look, if God be for us, who can be against us? We're on the winning side. The Lord shall be thy confidence and shall keep thy foot from being taken. You know, we need to pray. And you say, well, I'm just nervous. I'm scared. Here's the best way not to be scared and nervous. Do it more. Because the first year of soul winning, I was nervous every time for the first year. The more you do stuff, the less nervous you are. The first hundred times I preached, I was very nervous. But after you've preached a hundred, two hundred times, you're not as nervous anymore. So the way to get over fear is to, number one, pray for boldness. Say, oh Lord, please give me boldness, Lord. Remove fear. The Bible says, God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. You say, why is this important? Because your fear or your boldness comes across under the person that you're talking to, whether you know it or not, whether you think it does or not. Have you ever heard the expression that they say dogs can smell fear? Yeah. And if, you know, and the dog smells fear, it's going to chase you and bite you more. It, you know, everybody can smell fear. And when you come to the door and you're weak and timid and cowardly, you know, that rubs people the wrong way. They, they can sense that about you. Okay, so it's better to go in boldness and the power of the Holy Spirit and, and, and go to that door with confidence and look them in the eye and be there to preach the gospel. Okay, not only that, but you know, God commands us to preach it with boldness. And so the best way to get boldness is number one, go soul winning more and get the experience. It's going to come with time. And number two, pray for boldness. This should be a prayer request. Pray it for yourself and for others. Okay, now, so, so that's the first three things. Don't knock like the police, smile and be friendly, pray for boldness. So what do you say when that door swings open? You know, you get there, you're smiling. Here's what I say. I say, hi, I'm Pastor Anderson. You know, you would say, my name is whatever, fill in the blank. And I'd like to invite you to Faithful Word Baptist Church. And we have these invitations. So this is just a good icebreaker just to say, hi, how you doing? I'm Pastor Anderson. Just want to invite you to Faithful Word Baptist Church. I hand them this. And then I just say to them, do you go to church anywhere? So it's a, right away, I'm getting to the point. Don't you hate it when people come to your door and they don't get to the point? Yep. Oh, nice dog, nice flowers. Nice. It's like, what are you here for? Okay. <laughs> so I just show up and just say, hi, how you doing? I'm Pastor Anderson. Just want to invite you to Faithful Word Baptist Church. Do you go to church anywhere? Now, they're either going to say, no, I don't go to church, or they're going to list for you, you know, the, the, the church that they go to. They're going to tell you, hey, I go to First Church of the Deep Freeze, or I go to, you know, Second Presbyterian, or I go to Grace Community, or I go to, you know, Holy Martyrs of the Faith, Catholic Church, or whatever. So, you know, whatever church they give you, no matter what they answer, my answer is always the same. So I hand them this and say, oh, do you go to church anywhere? No matter what they say, doesn't matter what the name of the church is that they give, I always say, okay, well, more important than going to church, if you were to die today, do you know for sure you go to heaven? So that's, all, you know, so first I just invite them to church, ask them if they go to church anywhere, and then if whatever they answer, I just say, well, hey, more important than church 
if you were to die today, do you know for sure that you'd go to heaven? And that's a great question to, to get on the subject of the gospel, on salvation. You, you're kind of gauging where people are at in what they believe by asking that question. And you say, well, what's the significance of that question? Well, the Bible says, these things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life and that you may believe on the name of the Son of God. And the Bible also says in Romans 8, 16, the Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. So, you know, people who are saved, they know they're on their way to heaven. Okay, because they know this is through faith and they know that they've trusted Christ. So that's why that's a great question to start with. Now, Here's how you would adapt this into an informal situation, meaning you're not out soul winning, you're not knocking doors, you're, you're just with a guy at work, you're driving in the work truck together on a long drive, you're alone together, you got a good opportunity there. And by the way, anytime you're alone with somebody, that is an opportunity to give the gospel. Amen. Anytime you're alone with someone. Now I'm not saying, hey, let's stop working, let's keep the clock going. But let's stop working and just talk about the gospel for the next hour. Obviously, that would be dishonest to do at your job. But a lot of times you're driving. And, you know, it's either that or listen to a bunch of junk on the radio or talk nonsense. So when you're alone with somebody in that work vehicle, that's a great time to, to give the gospel. Or at lunchtime or whatever the opportunity arises, you can get people saved at work. But here's how you would adapt this to friends, family, co-workers. Basically, all you have to do is just ask somebody, hey, do you go to church? Or you could even say, are you a Christian? That's another great question. So, you know, if I'm, if I'm driving down the road with my buddy at work, hey, Joe, are you a Christian? And he says, yes. Then I say, well, let me ask you this, Joe. Do you know for sure if you died today, you'd go to heaven? And then here's the thing. Everything else I teach about soul winning is the same from here on out. Now, the biggest mistake I made when I first started soul winning was that when I went door to door, I had a lot of great success. But in family, friends, co-workers, I was failing because I felt like I had to approach it completely differently. And you'd get in these big, long, drawn out discussions all over the place for two, three hours. Treat day-to-day treat -day -day soul winning like you treat the door to door soul winning and you'll, you'll be successful. That's the best tip I can give you. That's why it's so great to go door to door. You get all this experience and practice. Now you can get your loved one saved. So it's real easy. You start the conversation in a similar way. Just, hey, Frank, do you go to church? I mean, is that really an awkward question to ask? Is that really weird or uncomfortable or strange or random or out of the blue? Just to say, hey, do you go to church at all? It's such a great question to start the conversation. And then you just say, oh, okay, well, do you know for sure? If, if they say, no, I don't, then if they say no, you could just say, are you a Christian? And if they say, no, I'm not, just say, well, hey, let me just tell you what the Bible says about how to be saved, you know, so that you can become a Christian, you know, and, you, and if you want, you can decide whether you believe it or not. And if they say, yes, I am a Christian, then do you know for sure if you died today, you'd go to heaven? Pretty simple, huh? And it's a great way to bring up the gospel. It's easy. It's not awkward or uncomfortable or strange. It's just an easy way to bring up the gospel to your friends and, and loved ones and so forth. Okay, so what do we do with their answer when we ask them, you know, hey, do you know for sure if you die today, you go to heaven? If they say no, then you just say, can I take five, ten minutes and just show you from the Bible how to be saved then? Can I just show you some scriptures, how you can know for sure? Because if they say they're not sure, then say, well, hey, can I just show you from the Bible how you can know for sure? You'd like to know that, right? Okay, here's the thing. If they express any doubt, that's where I would go next. So if they say, what, what about this? What if I ask them, hey, do you know for sure if you die today, you go to heaven? And they say, yeah, I, I think so. Is that 100% sure? Or what if they say, like, yeah, I'm pretty, I'm pretty sure I would. Is that 100%? No. no. So any, any, anytime somebody says, yeah, I'm pretty sure, I just say, well, can I show you how you can be 100% sure? Because right. there's a difference between 100% sure and pretty sure. So when they say pretty sure, I think so, I hope so, maybe, I have no idea, then I say, wait, can I just take a few minutes and just show you from the Bible how you can be 100% sure? Okay. Now, if they say yes, let's say they say yes, I know 100% sure, does that automatically mean that they're saved? No. <laughs> if they say yes, I know for sure I'm going to heaven. So then the next question is, okay, well, what do you believe it takes to get there? That's my next question. Just what do you believe it takes for a person to get there? 
Now, at this point, they might say, well, you got to go to church. you got to live a good life. you got to follow all the commandments. Well, then right away, they're showing you they're not, they're not trusting faith in Christ. They, they're believing in works. So that's why the next question uh, after do you know for sure is if they say, if they express 100% certainty, then you say, well, what do you believe a person has to do to be saved? Okay. And, and if they give you all this, you know, answer of work salvation, then I just say, hey, you know, the Bible actually says something different than that. Can I show you what the Bible says we have to do to be saved? That's where I go next. Now, sometimes they'll give you an answer where you'll ask them, what do you think a person has to do to go to heaven? And they'll say something like this, just believe in Jesus, which is, which is the right answer. Or they might word it in a way that they've grown up with. Like they might say something like, hey, you just have to accept Jesus as your Savior. Or you just have to ask Jesus into your heart or believe in Jesus. Or however they word it, something along the lines of it's not works. It's just, it's just through being saved through Jesus. Okay, so if they give you that kind of an answer, you know what? You, they still might not be saved. Because a lot of people just say that. So then there's one more question I like to ask to weed out, just to make sure. And that is, do you believe there's anything you could ever do to lose your salvation? You know, if, if you, let's say you were to do something really bad, or, you know, let's say you quit going to church. Because then a lot, a lot of people will just be like, oh yeah, to be saved, just accept Christ as Savior. And then you're like, okay, do you think there's anything you could do to lose it? Oh yeah, of course. I mean, if you don't live right, you're going to lose it. It's like, wait a minute. You just told me all you have to do is just receive Christ as Savior. Now all of a sudden you got to live right. You got to keep the commandments. You got to go to church. So look, here's one thing I don't do. I don't stand at somebody's door and badger them and ask them 20 questions. I don't just grill them and interrogate them and ask them 20 questions. I mean, all I'm asking them is just, do you know for sure? How do you know? Do you think you can lose it? That's the series of three questions. You know, is it perfect? No, but it'll weed out 99% of people that aren't saved. Okay, so I don't like to just, because sometimes, you know, you can be obnoxious when you ask them 15 questions. So, just, you know, just those three questions will weed out and help you determine. Now, is it really possible for us to know for sure that anybody is saved or not saved? I mean, we kind of just know that about ourselves. We know our heart, but this will be 99% accurate or whatever. That's, that's the way I see it. If you ask them, do you know for sure? How do you know? Can you lose it? That is a good way to determine where these people are at spiritually. And if they get any of the questions wrong, it's, hey, can I just show you from the Bible what the Bible says? It'll just take a few minutes. Let me show you how you can know 100% sure according to the Bible, the Bible. And be kind about it. Like, whoa, that is the wrong answer, buddy. You just got 100% wrong. Let me show you what's really going on, pal. You know, you be kind about it and just say, hey, the Bible actually says something different. Can I just show you a few verses? Just show you? Okay, so that's how you get into the conversation. Now, if somebody says no at that point, some, sometimes at that point, somebody will say, no thanks, I'm busy, I've got food on the stove, I'm watching the kids, I don't really have time right now. You know, they're holding a video game controller in their hand telling you how busy they are. But if somebody is busy, they say no, they don't want to talk, then here's what I always say. If they say yes, I show them the gospel. But if they say no, I say this. Okay, no problem. I understand, you know? And I just say, let me leave you with the one quick verse, though. Yeah. But first I say, no problem, I understand. Because that way, they're more receptive to listen to the one verse. Because I'm acknowledging the fact, okay, you don't have time right now. Let me leave you with one verse. Why leave them with one verse? Uh, go to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Why leave them with one verse? Because one verse is better than nothing, that's why. That's right. And because God's Word has power, and I've talked to a lot of people who heard one verse that really made an impact on them. And they thought about that verse for years. And then eventually later, years later, they got saved. Because God's word is powerful like that. So you're doing a great thing if you can just leave somebody with one powerful verse. You've accomplished something. You might go out soul winning for an hour and you say, hey, we couldn't give the gospel to anybody. But you'll probably leave one verse with 10 people. Yeah. You're doing something for God. You're making progress. You're accomplishing something for the Lord. Look what the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 3, 5. Who then is Paul and who is Apollos, but ministers by whom ye believed, even as the Lord gave to every man. I have planted, Apollos watered, 
but God gave the increase. So sometimes one person plants that seed of the word of God, another person comes and waters it and reaps the harvest. And then it says this, so then neither is he that planteth anything, neither he that watereth, but God that giveth the increase. Now here's the key verse in verse 8. Now he that planteth and he that watereth are one. That is a key statement. Everybody understand that. He that planteth and he that watereth are one, and every man shall receive his own reward according to his own labor. What does it mean when it says they're both one? It means that the same person both plants and waters. So basically, when we go out soul winning, sometimes we're going to be planting, sometimes we're going to be watering. Now, some people just say, well, all I do is plant. That doesn't jive with this verse. This verse says, either plant and either water, they're one. Same guy. We're all doing both. So you don't want to just never get anybody saved. I, all I do is just give everybody a verse. No. You know, you do both, okay? So that's why we leave them with one verse. Now, what's, you say, well, what verse should I leave them with? Well, one of the verses that I would leave them with is John 3.16. You know, it's a famous verse. They might have heard it before, and it's powerful. It teaches the gospel. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And I give them that verse, and then I just give them a quick thought about that verse. Notice it doesn't say whosoever joins the church. Notice it doesn't say whosoever keeps the commandments. It says whosoever believeth. That's because all you have to do to be saved according to Scripture is believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. It's not based off how good we are. We're all sinners. We, don't, we all deserve hell. We're saved through believing in Christ. So basically, I'm just giving them a super fast gospel in a nutshell with one verse. Not enough, you know, for them to fully understand the gospel probably, but it's something to give them to think about. It's a good planting of a seed. So I give them one verse... And then I expound it in about 20, 30 seconds. And then I say, hey, have a great day. Because I don't want to leave them with a bad taste in their mouth, you know, because I want the next guy to be able to come along and be able to present the gospel. Now, you say, why even ask? Why don't you just get straight into the gospel? That's what I used to do. When I first started holding, I said, I'm not going to ask people if they want to hear it. Just preach it to everybody. But here's what I noticed. I was wasting a lot of time with people who weren't listening and didn't want to hear it. And there's somebody else down the street who does want to hear it. So if somebody doesn't want to hear it, they're completely not interested, they're hardened to the gospel, I don't want to sit there and just talk to them for 20 minutes while they're going, yeah, uh -huh, yeah, and just not listen. It's a waste of my time. My time is valuable. So therefore, I'd rather just leave them with a verse. So I'm not just, I'm not just saying, well, nuts to you. I'm leaving them with the scripture, but I'd rather get to the guy. When I go soul winning, my goal, and different people have different goals with soul winning. You know what my goal is with soul winning? Get people saved. Get people saved. My goal when I go out soul winning is get somebody saved. And if I'm talking to somebody that has no interest in what I'm saying, I'm moving on. You know, because I want to get somebody saved. Now, if we had unlimited time and unlimited energy and unlimited resources, yeah, we'd, we'd just put our foot in the door and talk to every person and just keep going. No, it, it's smarter, I think. And different people have different opinions, but my opinion is I'd rather leave them with one verse and get to the guy who's interested, who's paying attention, who wants to hear it. Okay, so that's what I do. Now, uh, let's get into part two, the main presentation. So we figured out how to start the conversation, right? We figured out how to get into the gospel. What's a verse we could leave with them? John 3, 16, Acts 16, 31. 1 John 5, 13. Whatever powerful verse you want to leave and explain quickly. But if they say yes... Yes, show me. Well, now we got to show them. Which leads us into part two, the middle. So we've covered the beginning. Now we're into the middle, okay? So now it's time to open our Bible and actually show the person how to be saved. Now, here's something that I think will help your soul winning. Just realize that the same gospel works for everybody. You know, you don't have to have a different gospel for every person. Because guess what? And I'm not saying you have to do it the same every time. Because you might just get bored with that, and you might just talk to different people in different ways. But as a beginner, it's smarter to just learn one way to do it and get used to turning to those scriptures, finding them, know how to explain it. Then as you get more advanced, you can branch out, you can use a little more variety. But in the early days, it's smarter to just get a system that works, use it, get good at it. And you know what? This system that I'm teaching works. Are there other ways to do it that work too? Yes. Are there other good ways to go soul winning? Yes. This is the way I go soul winning. And I've done it uh, every single week virtually 
for the last, let's see, I started when I was 17, I'm 32 now, 15, 16, going on 16, this summer it'll be 16 years that I've been using this method to win people to Christ. And I've taught it to many, many people who've used it successfully. So this method works. When I first started sewing, you know how I did it? The way that the guy taught me. And then once I got comfortable with that, I started making it my own. And that's the best way to learn. Okay. So when you give the gospel, don't feel like, oh man, it's a Jew, I need a totally different gospel. Oh, it's a Catholic, I gotta go totally different gospel. Mormon, totally different gospel. Atheist, totally different gospel. Now look, those religions do have some things that specifically need to be addressed. I tag those on at the end. I tag them on at the end. Because I don't just want to just start out first thing, let me tell you about the, the great whore of Revelation. <laughs> you know, uh, the Roman Catholic Church. You know, I'm not going to sit there and just write, because then people are just like, whoa, you know. So I always give the plan of salvation first. Because what is the power of God unto salvation? The Bible says I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. That's another one quick verse to leave with people, by the way. Notice it says to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first, and also to the Greek. So what's the plan of salvation for the Jew? The gospel. What's the plan of salvation that the Greek needs? The gospel. What's the gospel? The death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. Amen. Faith in the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ for the remission of sins is the gospel, and it works for everybody. It's the same for the Hindu, the Muslim. You say, well, I, I'm afraid to go soul winning because I don't know what to do when I talk to a Muslim. Give him the gospel. I don't know what to do if I'm confronted with an atheist. Give him the gospel. I don't know what to do if they're Hindu. Give him the gospel. It's the same for everybody. Believe on Jesus Christ works for everybody, if they'll believe. Okay. So, the first thing I do, now that this main, now we're into the meat of the presentation. That was all the intro, getting into the conversation. Okay, the meat of the presentation. Now, there are four elements to the meat of giving someone the gospel. The four elements that I see when I'm giving someone the gospel is, number one, I've got to show that person that they're a sinner and that the punishment is hell. Because here's the thing, if, if they don't know that they're a sinner, and if they don't know that the punishment is hell, what are they even being saved from? The Bible says they sh that, that thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. How can you be saved from your sins if you don't even admit that you have sins? You don't even know what sin is. You don't even acknowledge your sins. Okay, so the first thing I'm gonna do is show them they're a sinner, and show them the penalty of sin. That's the first thing. Secondly, I'm going to explain to them how Jesus Christ came to this earth. I'll explain his life and ministry and how he died and was buried and rose again to save us from our sins and to save us from that punishment. Thirdly, I'm going to show them from the Bible that faith alone is what saves us. That believe, and faith just means believing. That faith or believing is what saves us and that it's not our works that save us. It's not by being good or getting baptized or going to church. And then the fourth element that I'm going to show them is that you cannot lose your salvation. That is eternal life. Okay? Those are the four elements. Now look, there are a lot of people in our church that have been soul winning for a long time. And if you go soul winning with them, you're going to say, wow, they don't go soul winning the same way as you do, Pastor Anderson. They do it much differently. That's fine. That's okay. That's great. I mean, there's a whole Bible filled with verses to use to give the gospel. And there's more than one way to skin a cat. And you don't have to all be a bunch of clones and robots doing it the exact same way. But I recommend, as a beginner, don't try to get all crazy and creative. As a beginner, if you're smart, you'll find somebody who's a successful soul winner, Pastor Anderson, learn his method, use it, and be effective. Then start to develop your own style. And look, I think everybody should have their own style because God could use us all differently because we're all unique. There are people that if I went to give them the gospel, they won't get saved. But if you talk to them, they will because we're different. We have different, per they might be put off by me, but they like you, you know, and, or vice versa. Usually that's how it's going to be though, that they're put off by me and they like you. Okay. <laughs> People don't like me. I don't know why. But anyway, what I'm saying is that, you know, everybody's different. Nobody is going to be exactly the same, especially once they get more advanced. They're going to do it their own way. But let me say this. Those four elements need to be there. Or you're not being thorough. 
You know, you need to have, I mean, you need to go over the fact that they're a sinner and that hell is there. That's an important component. You need to go over the gospel of Jesus Christ and the fact that of his death, burial, and resurrection and, and teach that, who Jesus was. And not just assume that everybody, well, you know the whole story. You know, just explain it briefly, okay? You need to go over the fact that salvation is by faith alone and not of works. It's critical. And listen to me now. You need to go over eternal life yeah, with people. You need to go over eternal security of the believer. And you can, and a lot of, and this is where we diverge from a lot of independent fundamental Baptists. And here's the thing. Every independent fundamental Baptist will agree that you cannot lose your salvation. That it's eternal life. And that once saved, always saved. And if you don't believe that, you're not saved. Right. Okay, and you should listen to my sermon. I preached a sermon a, a few months ago called Once Saved, Always Saved. You can download and listen to it. And it, it, it makes it very clear scripturally and why you have to believe that. But here's the thing. Most fundamental Baptists, they skip that component completely. And they'll go out and just, hey, you're a sinner, you know, Jesus died for you, believe on Christ. And a lot of times, you know, they'll, they'll go through it really quickly and not really make the gospel clear. Sometimes they'll even spend just two minutes, three minutes, four minutes. And, and this is where you, they get a reputation for one, two, three, repeat after me, wham, bam, thank you, ma'am, kind of just a quick soul winning, just, just blast through it. Now look, when I go soul winning, I don't, I'm not trying to race to the next door. Right. And you need to love and care about the person that you're talking to enough to do a good job. Yeah. And not just, oh man, I want to blast through this and get to the next door, boom. No, you need to love and care about that person enough to do a good job and to do your best. Look, I'd rather have one conversation that I did a good job on than a bunch of sloppy conversations. Those are real human beings. Take your time and do it right. And I'm not, but look, don't beat a dead horse. If they understand the point, move on to the next point. You don't need to just beat a dead horse and keep going over the same thing. You'd be just super redundant. But take the time necessary. Is it possible to win somebody the Lord in five or ten minutes? Yes, it is. Yes, it is. But here's the thing. That's somebody, if you can win them the Lord in five minutes, it would have to be somebody who is already ripe for the picking, they already know a lot about the gospel, right? They're already like, you know, 90% there. And look, there are a lot of people out there like that. Yeah, who they, you know, they know a lot about Jesus. They already know a lot of, about who he is. They already know a lot of verses, but it's just, they've just never been saved. They just don't get it that it's by faith alone. Those kind, sometimes you'll run into people like that where they already know a lot and you just have to go over points three and four with them. Yeah. And you can crank through. So look, I'm, I'm saying this, for me, and everybody's different, for me personally, an easy person who already knows the gospel a little bit, but they're not saved, but they've heard a lot about Jesus, they're a person who's in church, to me, the average that it's going to take me to thoroughly go through the plan of salvation with that person is about 10 to 12 minutes, is what it's going to take, just for an easy victory. Five minutes would have to be just a, the perfect scenario you know what I mean but honestly 10 10 or 12 minutes is about what it takes me how many minutes does it take you brother guy I know you always recite how many minutes it takes him like you know he'll you don't say 15 I go so many with him he tells him today it's gonna take me 14 minutes it's always really accurate but anyway <laughs> he takes about like 14 minutes to go through and look nobody could say that brother Garrett is not being thorough yeah. and here's the thing a lot of people will attack us. You can't get somebody saved in 10 minutes. You can't get somebody saved in 15 minutes. And here's what I always say to them. I always say, okay, watch my 10 minute soul winning demonstration on YouTube. That's exactly 10 minutes long. Watch that demonstration and then tell me what I left out. And I said that to a guy, he, a pastor, he went and watched it and he said, you know what? You're right. You didn't leave anything out. You did give the gospel clearly and effectively in 10 minutes. Okay, because you can't just look, you can't just, it's not about a number. Right. It's about being thorough. You can be thorough in 10 minutes. But here's the thing, if somebody is a child, it's probably going to take a little longer than 10 minutes. Because you got to really break things down to them. If somebody is like really mixed up in a false religion, 
It's probably going to take a little longer because you're going to have to kind of explain why some of that stuff is wrong. It could take 15, 20 minutes. But I would say that an easy victory is like a 10-minute deal. Just, just the person who's just, and that's what the basic soul winning demonstration online is. It's just a basic, easy, perfect scenario is what that is. That's why it has basic in the name. Okay. You know, something more advanced, like we uploaded a demo, uh, Brother Stucky and I, Brother Garrett and I, we made some demos demonstrating like a Pentecostal, demonstrating like Joe's was. I think those videos were more like 15 or 20 minutes because you had to deal with some of that stuff. Okay. But again, just be thorough, take your time and go through it. This isn't just a race to, hey, we've talked to 20 people. You know, it's, no, I'd rather just get one person saved and do it right. And then move to the next door. I say this, talk to every person like it's your mother. It's good. I mean, if you're talking to your mother, would you just be in a hurry to get to the next door or would you do a good job? So, you know, I, I, it usually takes about 10 minutes minimum. It's, uh, you know, eight or 10 minutes minimum, I would say. But again, don't get too hung up on the number, okay? So those are the four components. They need to be there, okay? Those elements need to be there in order to be thorough. Now let's back up, and again, I'm not gonna get through all this this morning, but now let's back up and let's look at those four components, okay? And slow down. Number one component is show them that we've all sinned and that the punishment's hell. Here's where I go to show them that. The first place I go is Romans 3.23. And in Romans 3.23, if you wanna turn there, it says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So that's just a great verse right there just to show them that they're a sinner. And you're not really pinpointing them because you're saying all have sinned. Yep. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. It doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter how good you are. You come up short. You don't measure up to God's standard of right and wrong. Now, an optional verse you could also turn to I would say Romans 3.23 is the core verse. Here's an optional verse you could turn to if somebody makes a weird face when you show them that verse. Romans 3.10 says, As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. That's another supporting verse that you could use if you feel it's needed. To say, hey, I'm not righteous, you're not righteous. You know, someone who's righteous, someone who's doing right all the time. You know, we're not righteous, we're sinners, okay? Then I want to show them the penalty for sin. I just flip over one page in my Bible to Romans 6.23. Just, it's convenient. It's just right there. Boom. And I show them the first part of Romans 6.23 where it says, For the wages of sin is death. And I say to that person, you know, we're all going to die someday physically. But the Bible talks about a second death. Let me show you in Revelation. Okay. So I show them that the wages of sin is death, but I say physical death is not the end. That's not it. It's not just you die physically and that's it. I take them to Revelation and I show them the second death in Revelation 2014. And in Revelation 2014, the Bible says, And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Now, the Bible teaches that the lake of fire, the place, the lake of fire, is known as the second death. Now, a lot of people think this event is called the second death. No, the place is called the second death. And I'll prove that to you. So I show them Revelation 20, 14, and 15, and I say, hey, this is the second death. And I read them those two verses, and then here's what I ask them. What do you call that place that we just read about in Revelation? You know, because I say, here's the second death, lake of fire. And, you know, 99% of people are going to tell you it's hell. You know, you know, when they see the lake of fire, you're not in the book of life, you're getting thrown there. So now, so far, I've shown them, hey, you're a sinner, the wages of sin is death, but not just physical death, there's also a second death in the lake of fire, okay? Then I take them down to chapter 21, verse 8, same page, right down the page, 21, 8, it says, but the fearful and unbelieving and the abominable, and murderers, and whoremongers, and sorcerers, and idolaters, and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. So notice, the lake of fire and brimstone, which is the second death. See how the lake of fire is the second death? And I show that person this list of sins that are going to wind you up in hell. And sometimes I'll say to them, you know, you're probably not a murderer or a sorcerer. No, no, I've never done those things. But wait a minute, what about all liars? And I say, you know, I know I've lied before. 
have you ever told a lie before? And 99% of people are going to say, of course, I've told many lies. Yeah. And I say this, you know what? The Bible says all liars are going to go where? And then they say, the Bible says all liars are going to hell. Okay, so now what have they, what have they just understood? Wait a minute, I've sinned, I've lied. And I always say to them, you know, you've, you've probably done some of the other things on the list too. You might have. And you've probably other, done other things that are worse than lying. But even if all you've done was just tell a bunch of lies in your life, that's still where you're going. All liars, okay? Now, so that right there, what I just showed you, Romans 3.23, Romans 6.23, Revelation 20.14 and 15, and Revelation 21.8, that covers this point. This point has been fully covered by those scriptures, okay? To teach them that we're all sinners and we all deserve hell. Now, sometimes you might need a little more support on this because some people might balk at this, right? I show them this and they balk at it and say, you know, hey, I don't think we've all sinned. You know, then you're going to need some additional verses on being a sinner, okay? 1 John 1.10, for example. Or they might balk and say, well, you know, I don't think hell's a real place. Then, you know, you could, you could take them to some other supporting uh, scriptures. Uh, you know, Mark chapter 9 is a good place. You know, Mark chapter 9, the last, the last eight verses of that chapter, just nail it, okay? It talks about hellfire and it, it's eternal and everything. So, you know, there are other supporting places you could take them if needed. But, you know, really this covers it. But another verse that I sometimes like to throw in, if I feel that this needs to be really driven home, is Revelation 20.10. Because it's on the same page, you're already there. If I feel like it's needed, if I feel like this person needs to hear this point a little more in depth, I take him to Revelation 20.10 that says, And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are, and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. That really drives home that hell is an eternal punishment. So again, what are the core scriptures for this phase? Romans 3.23, Romans 6.23, Revelation 20, 14, and 15, and Revelation 21, 8. That's the core. That's the backbone, those four. And with a lot of people, that's all you're going to need because they've already heard about hell. They already understand it. They already believe in hell. A lot of the people we talk to, they already know that. They already believe in hell. So again, I don't beat a dead horse if people have got it. But if you need a little more support, you got verses like Romans 3, 10, 1 John 1, 10. You got Mark chapter 9. You've got Revelation 20, 10. You got Matthew 25, 41, just to, just to bolster what you're saying, okay? But once they get it, move on. Don't beat a dead horse. Now, a lot of Gospels today, the popular thing today when giving the Gospel, made popular by the Ray Comforts and Kirk Camerons of this world. You know, th their popular way to give the Gospel is to spend like 90% of your time on, on this point. And 10% of your time on the Gospel. Now, what does the Bible say is the power of God unto salvation? He said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God and salvation. They take a verse from Galatians out of context that says that the law was our schoolmaster to bring us to Christ, and they just take one verse out of context and just run with it. Hey, the law is our schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. It's the law that gets people saved. The law is going to get there. Just talk about the law. Just the law, the law, the law, the law, the law. The law is not the power of God unto salvation. And you know what? Yeah, the law is our schoolmaster to bring us to Christ because I wouldn't even know what lust was if the Bible had not said thou shalt not covet. I wouldn't even know what's, that stealing's even a sin if the Bible didn't say thou shalt not steal. So look, obviously the law is a schoolmaster to bring us to Christ because it shows us our need for a Savior. But let me tell you something. Most people out there, it doesn't take you 20 minutes to get them to admit they're a sinner. How long does it take to get the average person? Who, who, here, who here goes soul winning about every week? Hey, let me ask some people. How often does it usually take to get people to admit they're a sinner, Richard Miller? Just ask them. <laughs> yeah, five seconds? Yeah. How long does it usually take for the fair trial? Yeah, how long does it take to get somebody to admit that they're a sinner and that they've broken God's laws? It's like, it's almost automatic. Yeah. Duh, I'm a sinner. Okay, now, now that doesn't mean that they necessarily believe in hell or that their sins are condemning them to hell. That's why you go through four, five, six scriptures and, and explain that to them and teach them that. But when they get it, they get it. Now this trendy thing of, oh, the law, the law, use the law, use the law. No, use the gospel. Now look, do we need the law? Yes, 
But it's not the meat and potatoes. It's the appetizer. It's point one. We need to focus on where, where God puts the focus, which is Jesus. Jesus is the focus. The gospel is the focus. And I've literally read plans of salvation where like, it literally, 90% of the page is about how you're a sinner, you've sinned, you're sin, 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 you're wicked, you're filthy, you're vile, you're, you're scum. And then it's just like, oh, by the way, by the way, Jesus died for you, now pray this prayer. And it's like, whoa. You know, I mean, it's like they don't even, they don't even take time to mention the resurrection. I mean, it's just all about your sin, your sin, your sin, your sin, 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 sin. It's literally the fastest point of the four. Yeah. It should be the quickest point because it should be easy for people to see. Some people, it takes longer, but it should be the, it shouldn't take all the, and you know, ah, oh, you just, you just watered down, you're going soft on people. No, I'm just not an obnoxious jerk. <laughs> I'm not an obnoxious jerk that's going to stand at somebody's door and just tell them how filthy and wicked they are. Because guess what? It's a false doctrine anyway that says that you have to be filthy and wicked to go to hell. All you have to do is be a liar to go to hell. And you, you're sending the wrong impression to people if you, try to, if you try to really say, oh, you're a lot worse than you think, buddy. You, you are a murderer, you know, because you hate people in your heart and you have committed adultery because you're lusting after women every day and you're, you, know, you have done this and you've done this and you're wicked, you're vile. It, it can almost be counterproductive because of the fact that you're making it sound like you're going to hell because you're so bad. And then they're thinking to themselves like, well, no, I'm not really that bad. Yep. Okay, whereas when you show them the way that I'm teaching, I'm not, you know, I'm just showing you, look, you're bad enough. That's all that matters. I don't have to prove to you that you're filthy and that you're scum. All I have to do, you know, what's, I mean, that's just not, but yeah, point one, you're scum. That's a good way. You're going to get real far with soul winning. That conversation is going to go real far. But again, like I said, some people's goal with soul winning is not to get people saved. What's my goal when I go soul winning? get people saved. Yes, I'm going to be bold. Yes, I'm going to preach the word. Yes, I'm not going to trim the message. I'm not going to sugarcoat it. I'm not going to water it down. But I'm not going around to be an obnoxious jerk. And the Bible says there are some that preach Christ even of contention. They preach Christ for envy and strife. Have you read that scripture? It's in Philippians chapter 1. There are people who go out there and their goal is to be obnoxious. Their goal is to get arrested. Their goal is to infuriate people because it just makes them feel like, yeah, you know, yeah, we're, we're on the front lines. Yeah. But it's, it, it's dumb. Look, if you preach the truth, enough people are going to get mad at you without you just going out and purposely making people mad. Just preaching the truth is going to make, you're going to, look, you're going to have people freak out when you just say we've all sinned. And they, when you say that hell is real, they're going to freak out. And when you tell them later in the presentation, hey, you know, if you're trusting in the Catholic Church to save you and the priest and the sacrament, you're not saved. You're on your way to hell. That's going to make them mad enough. Why be obnoxious? There's no point. And you know what? You say, well, I'm just going to do what Kirk Cameron said. I'm going to do what Ray Comfort said. But you know what? Number one, Growing Pains was a stupid show, okay? But number two, <laughs> number two, that's, that's beside the point. Number two is that if you watch the soul winning videos uploaded by Ray Comfort and Kirk Cameron, have you ever noticed how the people never get saved in them? I mean, they have a show. It should be called like, How to Fail at Soul Winning. Because literally, I mean, literally, they just share, somebody just shared it. Somebody shared it to me some photo of a guy, of an unsaved guy, holding a DVD of a John Lennon DVD. And he holding the DVD. And here's the soul winning story of, of Ray Comfort. Ray Comfort's like, you know, I went and talked to this guy and I asked him if I'd give him the gospel and he didn't want to hear it. And I asked him if he wanted to watch this DVD and he said no. And I said to him, come on, you like John Lennon, don't you? Don't you like John Lennon? Because it's some, it's some DVD that uses John Lennon to give the gospel. What kind of a stupid idea is that? Kind of a foolish thing. But anyway, oh, come on, man. You like John Lennon, don't you? Oh, well, I do like John Lennon. Okay, well, here, take this. Hey, can I take your picture now holding that? And he agreed to let us take his picture. Please pray for him that he'll be saved. You're an idiot. You're a retard. I'd rather see pictures of your stupid cat. Send me pictures of your dinner. Why are you sending me a picture of your failed soul winning? 
of some, you gave a guy a DVD that he didn't even want, he has no interest in the gospel, and then you're so stupid that you're like, let's take a picture of it. Hey, here's a, here's a picture of me failing. I mean, look, even when I get people saved, I don't take their picture. But it would make way more sense to take a picture of somebody who got saved than somebody who didn't. Hey, let's just upload pictures of people who didn't get saved. I mean, these people are nuts. It's stupid. It's ridiculous. Amen. I mean, it, it, it'd be like if I said, it, I mean, I'm, I'm trying to think of an example. It's hard to find an example dumb enough of how you could do this. I mean, look, why don't, why don't, we, just, why don't we just start a YouTube channel of how-to videos, just every, how not to do stuff. Here's how, to, here's how to, to fail at changing a tire. Here's how to fail at changing your brake pads. Here's how to fail at, 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 at you know, putting up wallpaper. Here's how to grout tile and it comes out like garbage. It's just stupid. Like, what, if, if I want to learn how to go soul winning, I want to see somebody who's succeeding. Amen. Say, well, you know, but in real life you fail. Yeah, you fail, buddy, because you're a loser. Because you're not even saved, Ray Comfort. And you know what? In, you know what, the Bible? Hey, why don't we just change the title of the book of Acts to The Failures of the Apostles? You know why it's not called The Failures of the Apostles? Because they're getting people saved in every chapter. Because they're getting people saved. They're getting people saved. They're getting people saved. They're, getting people saved. they're, getting people saved. they're not just like, oh, will you please, please take my John Lennon DVD and pose with it so I can have something to put on the internet? And that's the loser that you listen to when you listen to Way of the Master and Ray Comfort and Kirk Cameron. And all their videos are like that. It's all fail. Fail, 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 and more fail. It's stupid. Who watches this stuff? Oh, man, but they are the power of God right there with that law business. Look, I see through your stupid New Zealand accent, buddy. I'm not impressed, okay? Your gimmick. Your whole life is a gimmick, Ray Comfort. John Lennon's your gimmick. Hitler is your gimmick. Your New Zealand accent's a gimmick, buddy. Growing pains is a gimmick. Amen. Yes, that is good. Okay, but anyway, let, let me just wrap up with this. We're out of time. So all we got on was point one. Point one, you know, I'm like Ray Comfort. I'm spending all my time on point one. But anyway, you know, the real important points are points two, three, and four. That's the important part, but that's what you have to come back tonight Amen. to learn about <laughs> to learn about the important part. But anyway, I hope you learned something today because honestly, we need to be giving people the gospel. And, and you know, door to door is where it all starts. That's where you get the experience, that's where you get a lot of training, that's where you gain boldness, my friend. But also, this is something that needs to be a part of our daily lives, our personal lives. We have a lot of opportunities, people that we work with, friends, family, loved ones. If we love them, we want them saved. We want them to go to heaven. I always say to people at the end of point one, I always say, so this verse says we all deserve to go to hell, but did you know that God loves us? And when they say, yes, I've heard that God loves us. I say this, if God loves us, does he want us to go to hell? And they say no. And I say, but was he just kidding when he said this verse? And they say, no, he wasn't kidding. So we do deserve to go to hell. But he loves us. He doesn't want us to go to hell. Here's what Christ did so that we wouldn't have to go to hell. And that's where I get into point two. That's where I get into the power of God. That's where I get into Jesus and his life and his death and resurrection. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Father, I, I pray that uh, everyone who's here would have learned something from the sermon, Lord. And that they would not just walk out and, and just not apply this, Lord. Please help them to, to learn these methods and these truths. I hope somebody who's sitting in the auditorium this morning would just say to themselves, Wow, I need to get out and knock some doors. I need, to, I need to go out and do some soul winning as a result of this sermon. I'm fired up. I'm excited. You know, God's working in my heart that I need to do some soul winning. Lord, I pray that there would be somebody like that in the auditorium this morning that would, that would uh, show up at, at some soul winning times and, uh, and then do that. Lord, I pray that others would maybe, if they've already been soul winning, maybe they've picked up a tip uh, that they could use just to be a little better of a soul winner, Lord, then, then it's worth it. And, and Father, I pray that many would come back tonight to hear the rest of the message. And in Jesus' name we pray, amen. And, and before we sing our last song, let me, let me just say this about, about soul winning, is that uh, we do have a lot of opportunities at our church to go soul winning. I mean, we, we and, and the reason why is because we want to make it convenient and easy 
for you to go soul winning, okay? And I understand you might not have a lot of time, maybe you live far away, and that's why we do this. And in the bulletin, you'll see that we do have, we do have the main soul winning time today at 1.30, and that's the longest soul winning time. That's like a three hour thing, okay, if you show up at 1.30. But here's the thing, if you've only got an hour, just bring your own car and go for an hour. You can just bring your own car and go for an hour. But the Sunday is the main soul winning time. It's like a three hour thing. But here's the thing, the other soul winning times that are listed there, which are the Wednesday nights at 5.15, that's a one hour thing. You know, uh, Monday, Saturday, and Sunday, the regional soul winning groups, that's a one hour thing. You know, that's a good basic way to do some soul winning. But not only that, even if none of these times or places work out for you, all you have to do is just ask somebody. Ask me, ask somebody, and we'll take you soul winning at your convenience. In, I'll, I'll go pick you up at your house and take you soul winning in your neighborhood or, or you know, a few blocks over. Just, you know, if you don't want to be embarrassed your first time in front of your neighbors. But anyway, you know, we can definitely go soul winning with you at other times. And, and you know, let me just quickly, real quick, just introduce to you the, the three leaders of the regional soul winning groups because you need to talk to them if you want to go soul winning in those areas. So Brother Richard Miller, go ahead and stand up. He, go, he, he does a soul winning time on Monday nights at 6.30. It meets at his apartment. So you just you talk to him, he'll give you the address, you meet there on Monday nights at 6.30. Then Brother Donnie Romero, go ahead and stand up so everybody can see you. If you live out on the west side, even if you don't live on the west side, but you just say, hey, I want to go soul winning on a Saturday. He's out on Saturdays at 10 o'clock, he lives out in West Phoenix around Thomas and 43rd Avenue, something like that. And so you can get with him. And then also Brother Sean Fairchild, go ahead and stand up. Sean Fairchild does a shorter soul winning time on Sunday afternoons at 2.30 out in Gilbert. So, you know, you live out that way or you just want to go soul winning out there and, and go with Brother Fairchild. So we, we try to make this convenient for you because we want everybody to be able to be a part of it. And this is one of the things that makes our church great is that we love people and that we reach a lot of people and that we knock a lot of doors. That's what we're all about. That's what we want to continue to be about. Uh, Brother Sigur, come lead us in another song.